Shenanigans. 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 Truth, lies, 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 shenanigans. Tru
Shenanigans. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Hey everyone, welcome to Truth, Lies, Shenanigans, the live streaming podcast, where your favorite host brings some of the most interesting headlines of the week to you and to our panel to discuss. And then we'll ask the question, is this truth? lies or shenanigans and of course we always try to have some fun with shenanigans of our own along the way my name is neil nix and we have an awesome show for you today the closing ceremonies for the olympics is today and we've got an amazing guest spotlight on 2004 silver medalist swimmer maritza mcclendon who was also the first african-american swimmer to ever make the u.s olympic <laughs> swim team we're going to get her thoughts on the Tokyo Olympics, hear about her time at that Olympics, and, her, and then find out what she's been up to since. Also, later in the show, Lizzie is talking about the officer that accidentally overdosed on fentanyl. Robbie wants to talk about Trump attacking the women's soccer team for winning bronze. And Gianni Storm has more on the effects of climate change. And as always, we'll start with a quick fire question and end with shenanigans, the game show. But before we get into the show, I've got to introduce you to our lovely host for today's show, the professor, journalist, editor, and sports intern mentor at ESPN, Miss Lizzie Enders. Woo -hoo! Yeah! 
What's up, what's up, everyone? Happy Sunday, Sunday. Sorry about all of the adjustments to my camera, but I have been filming or conducting class and meeting with my interns all week in every other room in my apartment except for my normal spot, which is here. Why? Because there is a monstrosity of construction going on behind me, and they have started the, they've started the clanking. So I wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and it's boom, clank, boom, Horrible. clank. And I can't oh. have that Horrible. background cacophony while I'm teaching, while I'm showing videos, while I'm trying to, you know, teach these children. So my camera's a little <laughs> off because it's the first time, because it's Sunday, it's quiet now. So I'm back in my normal spot. And I'm like, oh my God, I gotta make yeah. adjustments. Gotta make adjustments. But it's been a difficult week, but this coming week is the last yeah. week of teaching, last week of classes for the summer. I am so excited. Y'all have no idea. I so burn some stones for me, y'all. Burn some stones for me. Not stage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our gamer, our tech guru, and our bona fide rock star with the rock band Fallen Machine coming to you from Sudbury, Ontario, in Canada, Mr. Rob B. Rock. Ah, uh, what's up? What's up? It's uh, you know, it's been kind of a Sorry. lower key week for me. It's a, I was off and really just kicked around the backyard just played got a lot of critters we've got a feeding station for all the birds that the raccoons destroyed overnight you know it's just fun <laughs> stuff but it's uh... just regular summer fun uh yeah back to work on monday back to the grind jose is going to be uh jose still has another week off after her gum graft surgery so she's definitely earned that time off so she can kick into low gear and hopefully relax some more while i'm occupied yeah. for eight hours a day doing work stuff <laughs> Always working. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the critters, like aside from raccoons, hopefully that was the only critter, right? You guys had other critters Probably. besides raccoons? Yeah, yeah. Well, we had uh, some, <laughs> yeah, we had some trees removed from our property this, uh, just this last week. And uh, one of the guys was like, so what's your bear situation like? And I'm like, no, not bad. We, we see them every now and then. He says, yeah, because a lot of the trees are raked back here. So it's just like, oh, all right. As long as they stay on that side of the bush line, I'm good. <laughs> See, I wouldn't classify a bear that's as a critter. Scary. Like, I'm thinking little thing critter. Yeah, that's a bear terrifying. is like yeah. a bear. <laughs> stay a safe predator. out there, Robbie. Stay safe out there, Robbie. All right. And of course, our model, our actress, college student, and co host of TLS Unscripted, Miss Gianni Storm. Hey. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday, fun day, guys. Um, this week has been very busy, very, very, very busy, and I've just been running around. So um, burn some sage for me. Pray for me. But today is a, today is a good <laughs> today is a good day because it's a new moon. And you guys know I'm into astrology and um, mm -hmm. but even if you're not into astrology, it's a fresh start in a lunar cycle. So I'm setting out some good intentions right. for the Love for the rest it. of the month. All right, All right. and Gianni, awesome. you uh, you had another great episode of Unscripted on Wednesday. Tell everybody what you talked about and uh, where they can watch the next episode. So, so last week was a really good episode. We had another relationship relationship be type question on Unscripted. Um, we asked the question, I believe, would you would you handle your same would you handle your gay friends the same as you would handle um, your heterosexual friends? So interesting topic. You guys can check it out on Instagram at IGTV at TLS Live Show, or you can check us out live on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. That is an interesting topic. <laughs> yeah. So what's the what, what's the answer for the panel, Leo? <laughs> uh oh. I mean, oh, so you're saying? So the question was like, if my male friends were gay. Would I treat them the same as I would any other male friend, right? That is not gay, right? It's not gay. Yeah, I wouldn't treat them different. Hmm. Rob? People are people. Yeah. I'm not going to treat anyone I differently mean, I... just because of their sexual orientation. But yeah, by I treat, wouldn't... we meant like handle them like. See, I think you like I if some the women, comfortability. See, I think some women will, for example, share a bed with a best friend. A female best friend. 
I've never shared a bed with a male best friend. So it's not hard for me not to you know, stretch that. I mean, it just it wouldn't happen. <laughs> so. But I think, but I think, but I think, but I think that's because you do what you do. Like if you encounter a lot of male athletes who were in poor programs, they've been sharing beds because they have no other choice. Um, mm -hmm. I've shared a bed with my gay male best friend on numerous occasions, didn't think anything about it. But like you said, Neo, I've also shared a bed with my heterosexual or gay female friends. Like, you know, a friend is a friend. A friend is a friend. Like, yeah. I'm not, I haven't I'm not going to treat you any differently. Female friend. Okay. Unless I was you guys gotta watch looking it. for more than a friendship. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah. uh, you know, maybe that's my line. Maybe my line is the bed and I, I'm looking for something intimate if I'm in the bed. So <laughs> my line um, is yeah. I'm trying to sleep comfortably and I'm not sleeping on the floor. I so that's my thing. That's my thing. All right. But tune into Unscripted, y'all. Tune into Unscripted. Watch the clip. Give your opinion. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We got a pack show, so we got to get to it. It's our quick fire question. All right. Amy Cooper, the so called Central Park Karen, was recently interviewed on the podcast Honestly. She defended her actions that day, saying that she was traumatized by the experience and has since fled the country. You'll recall she called the police on Christian Cooper, a black man, after he was complaining her dog was unleashed in the park, saying to him, I'm going to call the police and tell them an African-American man is threatening my life, which she proceeded to do just that. What do you think about her doubling down? I'll start with Rob B. Don't come here and play the victim card. No victim. Did she go to Canada? Did she go to Canada? Yeah, she came to Canada. <laughs> Lizzie. Um, get out. Get out. Get out. You fled the country. Get out. We don't want you here. Gianni. Um, the audacity to even have an interview. <laughs> like I'm shook. <laughs> the flee the country makes sense though. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I'm in agreement with all of you guys. I'm glad she's one of Rob's compatriots now. So now she, now, now she said in an interview, quote, I was in a situation. I was alone in the park. I had been threatened. My dog was being lured away from me. And to the same extent of it, is, I'm sorry, and to the same extent, if it had been a white man, I would have said there's a white man threatening me. If it had been a white woman, lies. I would have said a white lies. woman is threatening. So it's just a descriptive term. She also said mm. the reason she said it multiple times to the police was because she had a bad connection with 911. So are you buying what she's selling? I'll start Hell with that. no. Yeah, there we go, Lizzie. Hell no, we're not buying what she's selling. And at the moment that she made that call <laughs> to 911, Christian Cooper, no relation to Amy, Karen Cooper, um, <laughs> he was not threatening her. He was not threatening no. her. Like it was a complete fabricated story. And we all know what happens if a white woman in the United States of America gets on the phone and says, an African-American man is threatening me. I just want to say and in the interview, in, a, in, a, in the interview, she says that um, uh, Christian Cooper admitted to um, uh, as dog. much said in, in, or in threatening her. Okay. She didn't say that, but she didn't say that in her first mea culpa. Mm -hmm. This is coming after the fact. Yep. Okay, so you, you, Karens of the world, you got to get your story straight. You got to get your story straight. Like, and the way I look at it, threatening her, I mean, he might have been threatening to call somebody on her, threatening oh, to... Oh, yeah, because she was <laughs> breaking the law. Because yes. the dog was yes. off leash. That what the threat was... It, she posed a threat to the general public by having the dog off leash. He carries treats to lure dogs off leash, which is a smart move. If you're a regular park patron, you're protecting yourself against idiots like her. And when I read this, I, I was blown away. It was such a victim centric interview. Her behavior that day was <laughs> shitty and it demonstrated her character, 
Racist bullshit gets called out here in Canada too, Karen. I'm just saying. And if you were doxxed, <laughs> if you were doxxed in the U.S., Robbie's coming for you. Robbie, my husband. One of the reasons she fled. I know. One of the reasons why she fled was because she was doxxed in the U.S. Well, what makes you think that the internet stops at that invisible line between our two countries? If people have that That's much thing, hate and animosity though. for you. They're gonna find you wherever you are. That's the it's... thing. I feel like I the only action I agree with is, but it is kind of stupid. She didn't move, but it's like some form of defense or some form of protection for herself because the internet is cruel. And so it's scary to like go against them. And I, I mean, she has her own issues and she's still playing victim, but I can see why she would leave. I can see why she, but I, I don't see why she would do the interview. That's. Yeah, that part was right. There's a, there's a it couple should of also be noted that, that when she was calling the cops, that she was seemingly choking the dog in question. Yeah. Oh, she, yeah, she, she was. was seemingly. So, she was literally I mean, choking. definitely choking that dog. So, that's, that's another, you know, part of this whole story. Oh, that's that's the, that. the problem is that she threatened him before she called the police that she was going to call the police on a black man. <laughs> she but said, yes. "I'm going to call the police and tell them." <laughs> that I'm being assaulted by, I'm, I'm being threatened by a black man. Oh yeah, by a black man, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I mean, then in that, she knew what she was doing. Dog. She's yeah. choking the dog, the dog that she loves so much. Yeah, yeah. that poor dog. Comments online. Yeah. Um, let's see, <laughs> love Robbie's face on her coming to Canada. It's Jeanette. <laughs> 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 Perpetrators claiming victimhood is so tiresome. Jacqueline Robinson says uh, she is vile. This is why we cannot allow these race baiting heifers <laughs> to get off without okay. with our forgiveness with all the other things uh, we black folks do to make our oppressors feel comfortable. She knew exactly what she was doing. Uh, Mike Winter yeah. says uh, she is a victim <laughs> about as much as Kyle Rittenhouse is a victim. Same entitled behavior yeah. except that she is crying all all powerful white woman tears. And uh, Mike Wolf says, Canadians are more forgiving, question mark. Ooh, and he got two responses right? from that. <laughs> no, not, not to racist assholes. <laughs> All right. All right, that's it for our quick fire discussion. That was great, guys. All right. So we'll get to some more headlines from our host a little bit later in the show. But right now, it is time to bring in our spotlight guest. Our spotlight is on silver medalist swimmer Maritza McClendon. Yeah. Welcome, Maritza. Hi, Maritza. Welcome. I just like saying your name, Maritza. I like the way it comes off the Maritza. 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 <laughs> Me too. Thank you. Lizzie says it differently. Let's see. It say it the way you. I mean, you know, I grew up Maritza. speaking Spanish, so I say the Spanish version, Maritza. Maritza. But, yeah. but, you know, it's Maritza. both ways. It's both ways. <laughs> both ways. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. All right, let me quickly introduce you to our audience. Before Simone Manuel, there was Maritza McClendon, who was a 2004 Olympic silver medalist swimmer born in San Juan, Puerto Rico. She began swimming at the age of seven after being diagnosed with severe scoliosis. And what began as a medical remedy turned into a historic career. Let me tell you about that career. 2004 Olympic silver medalist in the 400 meter freestyle, right? First African American, first African American female swimmer to even make the U.S. Olympic team. First African American to break a world record in swimming. First African American female to break individual American records. Three-time world champion, eleven-time NCAA champion, twenty-seven-time NCAA All-American, Team USA captain, two thousand three, two thousand five, two thousand seven. She's now living in. Atlanta, Georgia, Maritza is a wife, a mom of two young children, works full time and travels the country sharing her inspiring story and advocating to for water safety among minority communities. So Maritza, All I want right. to thank you so much for joining that. us today. Black yeah. girls swim. Black yeah. girls swim. Black girls swim. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I definitely wow. could not fit all of your accomplishments, and there were a lot of them into our short bio. So I wanted to give you a little more time to tell us more, uh, anything, anything more about yourself, um, and you know, and your career, and anything we can't Google about you. 
All right. So, well, I think that the bio you shared was really good. That's actually the one that I have on my website. So I'm pretty sure it's correct. (laughs) um, One thing, the one thing most people don't know about me until you hear me speak is that I love race cars. Race cars? And I like, yeah. So think think fast and furious. Um, I absolutely love to, which I actually just went to go see F9 yesterday. That was fantastic. But my first paycheck when I went turned professional, I bought a 350Z and souped it up, put it in gauges, had, had you know, twin turbo kit installed. Uh-huh. I had rims. No way. Stuff, <laughs> took it to the track in Brazelton, Georgia. I had a helmet and everything and used to race it on Friday nights. So. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. so you follow NASCAR a whole too? Different life. Like well, I like more of like the street racing side than okay. the NASCAR. Mm. Oh, nice. Very cool. I was going to say, Melissa, so kindred spirits kind of, because I used to work at Sports Illustrated, and I was once the NASCAR reporter, believe it or not, a young black woman. Uh I was a NASCAR reporter at Sports Illustrated. So (laughs) I understand the need for speed. I get it. I get it. I get it. (laughs) (laughs) I actually had an opportunity to sit in one of the uh, NASCAR cars, and they took me around, and I think we did like two laps. Man, I couldn't even move my nice. like my head was just like yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. crazy. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. How, how did that speed feel for you? How did that speed feel for you? Like were you scared? You know, at first I was a little bit intimidated because you're like you're literally inside a cage um as you're going down this track. I think we got up to like yep. I think it only took us up to maybe 180 to 200 just liability reasons. Only but, um it was great i mean i just i know i love i love the speed i think it's fun um yeah, i would love to car. be behind yeah. the wheel and driving myself car before, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Different. 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 all right so i'm actually going to turn things good. over to our, our our sports guru uh miss lizzie enders to kind of start things off so like i said you know in your introduction you are proof positive that black girls swim so give us just some background about how you got into swimming. Like, when did you first learn how to swim? So I actually got into swimming because of a, a medical diagnosis. I, was, I had scoliosis when I was about six or seven years old. And my doctor actually recommended either gymnastics or swimming. And growing up in Puerto Rico, my mom used to take me to the beach all the time. But of course, never had any formal swim lessons. I was fearless, terrified my mom to death. And she's like, let's do swimming. And um, I didn't learn in any fancy pool. There was, it wasn't an Olympic size whatsoever, just some guy's backyard pool. And he just said, okay, we're gonna do basic water safety lessons. By the end of it, you're gonna be doing, able to swim from one end of the pool to the other. And for me, that's where I fell in love with it. I loved just swimming. I just loved being in the water, getting to know people. Um, but I will say I wasn't one of those athletes that walked on the pool deck and was the number one athlete by any means. I had to work hard train hard you know mentally just be prepared to race and and you know over the years i became a little bit better at it but it was definitely a struggle i'm sure so when did you realize that you were fast in the pool good question interesting story so when i was 12 years (laughs) old i went to a swim meet in gainesville florida and i just got in the water i love to to race like i love to just win medals and trophies and um Mm -hmm. so that was like my motivation and I swam this one race and dropped an unbelievable amount of time and ended up making my, what we call a U.S. national cut. So I get to go to um, compete with all the top athletes in the entire country at the age of 12, which is unreal. Wow. So I think at that point, I, I looked at my mom and I said, this, this is great. Like, I, I love what I'm doing. And she just competed continue to support me, would let me compete at those top level meets and just continue to get the exposure. Can you tell us how swimmers choose their concentration? Because anyone who's watching like the world championships or the Olympics, they know, like I think your event was the freestyle, right? Correct. And so, but then there's breaststroke, there's butterfly, there's bat. So how do you choose? How do you choose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think as an athlete, it's the same as track. Like you have these, these, events that you do and there's some that you're better at and some that you're not as good at. Um, for me, I came from a swim program that allowed me to train and, and compete in various sports, or various events, sorry. And I was able to do all of them. So I'm the only swimmer ever to have won all the freestyle events at a college conference championship. So from the wow. 50 freestyle nice. all the way up to the mile, which is a sprint 
all the way up to a distance. Right. And, and then I also um, have also been really good at butterfly and I am. So I think as, a, as an athlete, yeah. you start to find those things that you absolutely love. So I love sprinting. That was my favorite thing okay. to do, but I had the ability to go across the gamut in some different events. It's yeah. something that always is intriguing to me because I, I learned how to swim when I was probably, I think five or six. Um, we had, you know, swimming as a part of our classes in elementary school, but they didn't teach us the other concentrations. It was always mostly freestyle. And then as I got older, maybe backstroke, but the backstroke always made me feel like, you know, I was just in a spa or something <laughs> that I was like, I wasn't supposed to be fast. I was just supposed to be chilling, you know? So when I see like Floating. all of these swimmers, yeah. yeah, when I see all of these swimmers, like, you know, really going for it and speeding, sprinting while they're in the backstroke. I'm like, I can never do that because I would just be like, yeah. oh, this is so beautiful, <laughs> you know? So props to you, props to you. Uh, let's see what Rob B has to say. Actually, I want to touch base on something you shared with us during your intro. I want to take it a different direction from your athletic career. And I want you to speak to me about the water safety instruction that you do because I live in Northern Ontario. We're surrounded by lakes and water safety is an integral part of our culture. So I, uh, I'm very okay. curious about the type of work that you are doing. Well, let me start out by saying that the drowning statistics that plague the black communities are higher than any other community. So 64% of African-American children don't know how to swim. And when I made the Olympic team in 2004, that number was 70%. And I immediately saw that, heard that statistic and I was like, it's crazy for me, a woman of color to make the Olympic team and break barriers, yet there's so many who look like me who have no idea how to swim. Mm -hmm. And swimming mm -hmm. is the only sport that is also a life-saving skill. Mm -hmm. So my main, mm -hmm. my main message is everybody needs to learn how to swim. And the fact that my black communities are plagued more than any other means I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot of messaging, a lot of education to do, make sure that, um, and that's what I do. I travel the, the country and I spread the message of, we have to get in the water. I offer free swim clinics. I get awesome. not only children, but also adults. Cause you'd be amazed at how many people are like, oh, my kids know how to swim, but I don't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yep. we're, we're yeah. gonna change that. Let's yeah. true. hope you got a yeah. suit, let's get in. <laughs> You know? The majority of my family members, even the kids, I mean, really have no idea how to swim. And we were at the beach uh, yeah. on vacation recently. And I mean, I can swim to save my life, um, mo mostly because of, uh, Lizzie and I went to a high school where they taught us to, how to swim. Um, but oh, wow. uh, so I can I can swim to save my life. But past that, I'm not a great swimmer. But no one else in my family, like if I had to, if one of the kids were, for example, drowning, I would probably be the one to have to go save them. <laughs> And I could probably just oh. barely save myself. I mean, I'm just saying. I, I don't like those odds. If there were know, a riptide, like right? Yeah. <laughs> if there's a riptide or something, I don't know if I can <laughs> pull it off. <laughs> and yeah. unfortunately, and, you know, in black communities, a lot of it has to do with access um, and discrimination because there was a time where black people in this country could not use public pools. Mm -hmm. And then as we moved out mm -hmm. of that, there still wasn't a lot of access to pools um, for yeah. urban communities in inner cities. So did you ever experience like the lack of access as you were trying to find a pool, as you were trying to, you know, swim and better yourself at your craft? And did you grow up in Puerto Rico or did you grow up here? So I, I was in Puerto Rico until I was about eight and a half years old. Okay. So I started cool. my swim career. I swam for about a year and a half in Puerto Rico. That's where my competitive career started. But when I came to the U.S., it was very different. I walked on to, I came from a team that was very diverse. We had all different cultures in Puerto Rico. Then I came to the US and me and my brother were one of four black kids on a team of 150 kids. Wow. And, and it, it was interesting. I mean, I can tell you right now that I, when I was nine or 10 years old, I went to a swim meet and I started, that's when I started to kind of beat a lot of the, the kids, right? And a lot of kids, a lot, but I'll say white kids, the parents would come up to me and be like, what do you, why are you swimming? Like, shouldn't you be on the track or shouldn't you go do basketball or, you know, basically a mainstream black sport. And they were picking yeah. on me because of the color of my skin because, and I was beating their children. So, <laughs> That's probably it, was, <laughs> it was definitely an issue from, from the beginning of my career, as soon as I stepped foot in the U S and started competing there. And 
you know, for me, access wasn't an issue. My, my parents knew that I loved swimming. So when we moved to Florida, that was one of the criteria. They're like, we need to find some place where, you know, Maritza and her brother, my brother, oh. Justin could swim. And so mm-hmm. thankfully mm-hmm. we found a great program, but that's not true for everybody. You know, like you said, right. Lizzie, the back in the day, black people weren't allowed at the pool. Then when you got to go to the pool, you had to go some of the deep end. You can't learn to some of the deep end. Like that's scary for a lot of people, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? And then, mm-hmm. you know, so there's that fear and there's that generational fear. So when your parents don't know how to swim, there's only a 13% chance that your child will learn how to swim because swimming is not part of the conversation. You don't yeah. realize that you, can, you can't go to a, a pool party and you're not gonna be the one, you're not gonna wanna watch your children drown. You're gonna be wanting to jump in and, and, and get them out and back to safety because that's what parents do. But you, you do that yeah. and you don't know how to swim that's not just one victim. It now becomes two, sometimes three. Right. So right. Yeah. that's a scary, Liz, that's a scary realization. Liz, Lizzie and I went to um, DC public schools um, system and um, Washington DC public school system. And I think there are two pools in the entire DC public school system. And of course the best pool was in a predominantly white neighborhood with mm-hmm. a very diverse uh, school, I mean, uh, class. Uh, or or, or um, students, um, but those there was one school that does have a pool, but that's in a in a poor neighborhood. But that's it, in all of Washington mm-hmm. D.C. Unless I unless I'm wrong, Lizzie. I think you're speaking about like you know current statistics because I went to. Um, which is a school that's no longer in existence, but Fort Lincoln um, Intermediate School back when I went there in second grade. So it was on Blatonsburg Road, um, right back, right on top of the hill where the cemetery is, Neo. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they had an indoor pool and an outdoor pool. And so in second grade, Swimming was a part of our regular yeah. course. Oh, wow. Yeah. Lucky. So we, we, yeah, we were in the pool mm-hmm. in second grade um, throughout the year, and then it kind of tapered off, and they, you know, allowed the parents to decide whether the kids wanted to, to, you know, pursue this further. But then when Neo and I got to high school, so we went to Woodrow Wilson High School, mm-hmm. 10th grade, it was a part of physical education. It was. And so we were wow. in the pool at 845, at least our class. I'm not, because you Your weren't class. international studies, Neo. I yeah, I don't think you were in the pool as early as us, but we were in the pool at 845 a.m., mm-hmm. which pissed me off. <laughs> like, I have hair. I had a boy that I was trying to impress. I did not want to be looking crazy for the entire day. So that's a good segue yeah. into the hair portion of the argument, Marisa, because I want to ask you about the soul cap. This, exactly, mm-hmm. right? Oh, the soul <laughs> cap. Yeah. The soul cap. <laughs> that's a good question. So for those of you who are not in the know, the soul cap was invented for um, women of color who have a different texture of hair, dreadlocks, braids, um, curly natural hair that doesn't necessarily fit in the regular cap that was made for white women whose hair kind of goes down. A lot of hair, but it goes down. Our hair goes up and out. And so Mm -hmm. a, a specific cap was made for women of color who have our hair texture, but that cap was banned right before the Olympics began. So what was your take on that? Like one, did you ever use a soul cap or growing up as a swimmer, what was your experience with swim caps? So I'll kind of tear this a little bit with a story. So when I was swimming, there was a lot of barriers for why black people weren't swimming. Access, financial, swim caps, swimsuits, you name it, there, there was something, you know, we're built differently. Mm-hmm. And what one thing for me is that we are now in an era where we have had companies and organizations that are now saying, okay, there's all these barriers, let's start to come up with solutions. And that's what SoulCap did. Mm-hmm. SoulCap came up with a solution and say, okay, we know that the caps that you wear, which I think you flashed a picture earlier, my, my, I mean, it, it is tight. Like you guys see, I have a lot of hair. That thing would be like this and it's still sticking out here. Yeah. And I had to like do this twisty thing and shove my hair in the cap. Um, you know, so for me, it was definitely for that, you know, that trial particularly, I cut my hair. I oh, wow. sat there mm-hmm. and I chopped it shorter because it was just another distraction. And so my biggest beef about this, the soul cap decision was more so about the words that were used as to why the cap was banned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
they yeah. said it did not fit the shape of a normal head, mm -hmm. which What's normal? I don't know what that means <laughs> because I'm pretty sure everybody's head was shaped differently. My Black, white, brown, don't too. matter. Oh. <laughs> um, and then they, on top of that, they continued on to say, none of our athletes have a need for a cap like that. And to me, oh, that sends wow. a terrible message, especially to people of color, that you don't belong our at athletes. the Olympic level. Our athletes. Yeah. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's a problem. You, you can't, if, you, if you're an organization that is meant to technically look at products and say, this is providing an advantage, it should not be part of the Olympics, that didn't do that. But don't come and subjectively say, the, our athletes don't have a need for this. You, you, have no, right. you have no idea, right? And that's, that's crazy because there's definitely somebody out there who has bigger hair than me, has mm -hmm. dreads, that has a vision of mm -hmm. becoming an Olympic swimmer. Mm -hmm. And a soul cap is a solution that provides them opportunity to not have to think about, how am I going to get all this in a swim cap so that I can go yeah. to the Olympics? It's what's just, the difference? I'm going to put it in a what's swim cap and go. What's the difference between a soul cap and a, and a regular cap? So soul cap has a little bit more space Spanish. to it. So a regular cap is very tight. It's like a dome shape. The soul cap provides a little bit more room and, and stretch for, for bigger hair, bigger dreads, all that sort of stuff to fit inside of the cap a little bit more, a little bit easier. Don't get me wrong. It's still going to be hard. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's definitely, um, a, it's an option, right? You think about, um, they did the same thing with goggles. There's different shaped head faces, eye sockets. They created different types mm -hmm. of goggles for different eye sockets, and those were approved, right? So, yep, so there's a sole cap, and you guys can see it has a little bit more room. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, I, I personally have not. Um, I'm retired. I have no intention of heading back into the pool <laughs> to compete. Um, <laughs> But I, but I will say I would have definitely um, tried. There's different sizes, so I definitely yeah, would have sure. tried it just to sure. see, okay. you know, if it fits. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, obviously, I've never been on any type of Olympic path for any sport. However, when I was swimming as a young kid, I stopped wearing caps because I just thought it wasn't doing anything for me. Sometimes they would come off. It, they didn't fit properly or my hair was still soaking wet when I got out of it. Like it just never provided any advantage to me. So I often didn't swim with the cap on and just, you know, would do a tight, tight bun or my mom would do like a, a braid in the back. But yeah, I, it, it, <laughs> a regular cap just never benefited me at all. And I'm talking yeah. as someone who was just swimming as a regular Josephina. Like <laughs> I was not, <laughs> I was not at your level, your caliber at all. So I can only imagine the advantage this would have afforded um, or the mm -hmm. amount of, not even yeah. advantage, the amount of normalcy this would have afforded, you know, women yeah. of color, people of color who have a different hair texture, yeah. you know? Before we get to Gianni. And I put it in, the, okay. I put it in this perspective. Oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead, Marissa. No, go, go I, ahead, I put it in this ahead. perspective. It, it's, it's kind of like saying, as an athlete, you want to be able to focus on competing and racing at your optimum. You shouldn't have to be mm -hmm. focusing on what swim cap am I wearing? What swimsuit am I wearing? What goggles am I wearing? Yeah. That, that yeah. stuff should allow, you should have whatever you need to feel comfortable so that you can focus on racing and getting one thing. It would be different if it provided some type of advantage, which it really does. It probably provides a, a mild disadvantage because you're not as, you're still not as, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, hydrodynamic. hydrodynamic. Thank you. With That's your the head. word I was looking yeah. for. Hydrodynamic. Uh, <laughs> right, before right. we get to Gianni, Gianni, uh, there's some comments online. So uh, Mike Winter says, if your parents weren't allowed in public pools, uh, them kids didn't learn how to swim. Parents are scared to watch their kids in the pool because they cannot save yeah. them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of people said it was 8 o'clock, not 8.45, Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I said 7.45. I thought I said 7.45. You said 8.45. But it, it, I'm sorry. sorry. I meant 7.45. I meant 7.45. Uh, um, yeah, we Brown were said, in the locker room at 7.45. Yeah. Um, Lizzie, I, I was swimming in the pool at 5 a.m. See, I could not. I could not. <laughs> I could not. I could not. I could not. Mm -mm. All right, Gianni. you for that dedication. Props to you. Gianni, go ahead. <laughs> um... I read in an interview that your inspiration was Amy Van Dyken. 
Um, and I just wanted to know why she was your inspiration. So when I was uh, growing up and watching swimming on TV, of course, it only happened four times every four years. And the very first time I watched on TV was the 96 Olympic Games. And I had the opportunity to watch Amy Van Dyken win four Olympic gold medals. Um, and she just sparked my love for, or my desire and my dream to be an Olympian. I was like, man, that's exactly what I want to do. Now, if you don't know Amy Van Dyken, she is 6'1", uh, white woman, very tall, very lean. Like she, she was just a powerhouse, you know, 96, there she is. Yep. And she, yeah. I just loved her, her fierceness in the water. And um, again, like I said, she just sparked my, my Olympic dream. And um, because of her, I started to train harder. I had the opportunity to swim with her. I, you know, I made the national team at 12 and 13 years old. So I had an opportunity to swim with, with her. And then every time I saw her, I'd be like, can I get your autograph? And she would gracefully be like, of course, and would sign autographs every single time. Um, and then sure <laughs> enough, you know, fast forward a little bit further down my career in 2002, I actually broke her American record in the 50 freestyle oh, um, nice. that has been, that was nice. unbroken for eight years. So. Wow. Wow. And she, she called me some code to say thank you. Really? She did a lot of commentary for this Olympic. So um, I, I mm -hmm. actually, I won't say I forgot about her, but you don't necessarily hear her name in casual conversation. So it was good to see her and hear her mm -hmm. for this Olympics. Did you watch a lot of the <laughs> swimming? In Tokyo? I did. I was glued. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know, I was right? trying to get my kids involved, but they were just like, no, nah, okay, this is good. It's been like a minute. I'm going to go. I'm going to run out. <laughs> so to that point, um, last week we had a former Olympic track star, Von Wade, on the show, and we were talking about Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka and athletes mm -hmm. prioritizing their mental health. Uh, now, Simone Manuel, who I learned is a, uh, you were a mentor for, um, she recently tweeted that the media should stop interviewing athletes after disappointing performances, after she didn't meet expectations at this Olympics. So uh, some people are saying athletes are getting too sensitive to criticism. What are your thoughts? I mean, it, it's tough. I mm. think for, and I think I, I watched Yvonne, yeah, I watched the episode too with Yvonne and she said it well, you know, back when we were, when we were competing, you couldn't find us on social media. We couldn't read comments about what people were saying, but we still had the media in our face, right? But now these athletes today are dealing with so much more pressure than we ever were, um, you know, over a decade ago where you're on social media, you're, there's videos on there, people making comments. It's like people are behind a computer screen, uh, have no filter whatsoever and have no problem saying how they feel about a certain athlete. And that's hard, you know, that's, that's hard for someone yeah. to read and it's, and it's not easy to ignore. Yeah. Yeah. So what was it? Yeah, I mean, good. how did you feel when you saw that? Uh, uh, <laughs> I keep want to say Emmanuel. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> when Simone Manuel, <laughs> Simone Manuel uh, won her gold medal in the last Olympics. That, that was amazing. I remember watching Simone, um, you know, even before, uh -huh. before Rio, just being like, wow, she's gonna be a phenom. I know she, I could tell how, how much of a powerhouse she is. I had an opportunity to talk to her a couple of times before her races and she just had this mentality that was just something that I admired. And when she got the Olympic yeah. gold medal in 2016, she, the first thing that came out of her, her mouth was, of course, glory to God. But then after that, it was thank you to Maritza McClendon who came before me. Oh. And oh. I, my oh. jaw dropped, I was like, she just said my oh. name. <laughs> I could not believe it. Wow. Yeah. So you know what I what I love about her is she she Beautiful. is recognition to those who came before her. And she, you know, we're yeah. a team now. You know, I may not be competing, but we're both sharing the same message of trying to get more black people involved with swimming and not just water safety, yeah. but also just get us to the elite level and get some more black people on that Olympic swim team. Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So I want to give you a few minutes to say any final words, anything you want to say, give shout outs, and also make sure you let people know where we can find you. So big shout out first off to Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. I don't know if right. you know, but I am a spokeswoman for a program called Swim 1922, where we are trying to make sure that our black communities know how to swim, especially ta tapping into the women of the family and making sure that they know water safety education. 
So shout out to them. Mm -hmm. I had no idea the impact that my medal had until I met them in 2012. I got my medal in 2004. Four. Uh -huh. So in 2012, wow. they had me wow. realize, because I, you know, I, I broke barriers in a predominantly white sport. And everybody around me was like, hey, good job. Yeah. And then I get around them and they're like, oh my gosh, do you know what you've done? Mm -hmm. and, you know, made me mm -hmm. feel really good. So major shout out to Sigma yeah. Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. I love those ladies, my sisters. Um, and we're continuing to spread the message about the importance of water safety. To find me on social media, I'm on Instagram at Ritzy Swims, Twitter at Ritzy Swims 04, and of course on Facebook. All right. All right, well, thank you so much, Marissa, for joining our podcast. We appreciate you. Yeah, we'd love to have you thank back you in so the much. future. So you're welcome back any, any time. Thank you so much for of joining Of course, of thank course. You, thank you so much. <laughs> See you soon. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Black girls swim, y'all. Black girls swim. Yes. I tell you. Black girls swim. Incredible, yeah. excellent. She's a fantastic excellent. guest. I mean, wow, her career. When, when you see her career and what she's done, I mean, it's... I, I was surprised. I personally hadn't heard of her um, prior to it. Um, but when I looked at it, I was like, I, know, I, know, I, I thought I recalled, I recalled the history of it for some reason, but I, I don't, I just hadn't heard of her. I don't know why. And it's, it's a shame that we had it. And I'm glad we're able to kind of bring yeah. it out. I, I'm glad. And yeah, I think also, too, a lot of people outside of the Black community here in America don't realize the difficulties that have come over the years with just trying to swim. Like it used to be against the law for black people to get in a public pool in this country. Yeah. You'll often hear about yeah. um, black celebrities who would show up at venues, show up at hotels to perform and the hotel would have a pool, Dorothy Dandridge being one of them, um, Lena Horne being another, they go out to the pool to take a dip in the pool to swim and not only are they removed from the pool, but then the facilities, they empty the pool because they felt like the pools were it's tainted. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle for black people in this country, but Maritza is proof positive, Simone is proof positive that black people can and want to swim. So I loved yeah. having her here, yeah, loved was, having was, her here. Was, Me yeah, too. That was awesome. Yeah. Wonderful guest. That All right. So we've got to get into our headlines of the week. So if you've never been to TLS before, each week our hosts bring headlines in the news they want to discuss. That host will tell everybody what's going on, then our lovely panel will chat about it for a bit, sharing their unique points of view on the issue until we see our friend Genji. And that's when we know Genji. time is up. And then that's when we're going to hear more from you. We'll take your questions and comments online. Then at the very end, we'll check with the panel to see if they think it was truth, lies, or shenanigans. Now, for our listeners wow. on we Apple We haven't podcast, done it yet. <laughs> we haven't done it yet. Yeah, we'll ask it at the end. So for our, our listeners on <laughs> Apple Podcasts, don't forget, you can also join in the conversation live on Sunday, 4 p.m. Uh, we stream on all major platforms, of course, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Find us at TLS Live Show or TLSshow.com. Oh, so now let's get to it. All right, we're starting with Lizzie Enders today. Lizzie, you had an interesting topic where a sheriff's deputy OD'd on fentanyl. Tell us about it. So this was a topic I'm randomly, you know, scouring the news over the week. And this was something that in my life was right on time because I had just had a conversation with a friend of mine who um, considers himself a recreational drug user and they tend to lace some of their drugs with fentanyl, okay? So I'm watching the news and I see this video of this cop um, in San Diego who was out on a call. So he and his partner were out on a call. They were investigating something, um, possible you know, drug paraphernalia, a lot of drugs in a certain location, whatever. They come across a car and in the backseat of the car, there are a lot of drugs, fentanyl, I guess the powder form being one of them. And he got too close to the fentanyl. And I don't think a lot of people realize how potent these drugs are. He didn't inject it. He wasn't a drug user. He wasn't using it on his own. He simply came into contact with it as he was doing his job. 
and this is what happened. Yeah, you know, have the video? Yeah, it's, it's a powder. Um, it could be cocaine or fentanyl. Dude. Yeah, it tested together. positive yeah. for fentanyl. Yeah, that stuff's no joke, dude. It's super dangerous. I was like, hey, dude, too close. You can't get that close to it. A couple seconds later, he took some steps back and he collapsed. Oh my I God. ran over to him mm -hmm. and I grabbed him and he was Odin. And I went to my trunk, I grabbed the Narcan, came down to him, grabbed him, and I, I did one nasal spray in one nostril, opened the other one, another nasal spray in the other one. I remember just not feeling right and then I fall back. And uh, I just, I, I don't remember anything after that. Just breathe, buddy. Breathe. Trying to get him to focus on, on just breathing. And because, you know, that fentanyl, you, you can't breathe. It was in an instant. It's as though you like, my lungs just locked up. I, 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 I couldn't breathe. I was trying to gasp for breath, but I, I, I couldn't breathe at all. Bye bye, you okay? Talk to me. Oh, no, no. Don't be sorry. You're okay. Don't be sorry. There's nothing to be sorry about. I got you, okay? So sad. That's so sad. I, I had the same reaction, Gianni. When I saw this, it just was very jarring, um, kind of teared up because, you know, yeah. this is a police officer who is out in the community trying to prevent other people from coming into contact with this particular drug. And he fell victim. And again, I don't think a lot of people really understand the potency here. And if not for the fact that his partner had, you know, the Narcan to, is it Narcan or Zarcan? I think it's Narcan. I think it's Narcan. Narcan. I think it's Narcan. Narcan. If not for the fact that his partner, you know, had the Narcan in his truck and immediately administered it to him, he would have died. He would have died yeah. right there on the yeah, spot. So Definitely. I just, you know, I, I wanted to bring this more, not necessarily as a topic that we need to analyze for 10 minutes, but more of an awareness type of topic, kind of like a PSA, yeah. but also to get the yeah. panel's reaction to this because opioid abuse is very serious. Mm -hmm. Drug abuse, as we know, is still very serious. And I don't think people are really taking it though as seriously. So I appreciate even the San Diego Police Department for putting this video out there and letting people know that, you know, it's not all fun and games with these highs that you're trying to get. You come into, you don't even have to ingest it the way you think you want to. Mm -hmm. And you right. can still be putting your life at risk. So what do you guys have to say about this? Can I start? Sure. Yeah, go for it. So, I mean, we're looking at, like, think about all the stars that have, we've lost because of fentanyl. My man. Prince. My man. Yeah. Michael Jackson. Oh, your man's Michael Jackson? No, my man is Prince. Uh, Michael Jackson is a pedophile. Prince. I don't deal with pedophiles. The yeah, Prince, so, yeah. Don't play, Liz, don't play Liz like that. <laughs> yeah, I know she doesn't like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we lost Michael Jackson. We've lost so many important... So, Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think Michael Jackson was... Uh, propanol, which oh, kind of has might be right, the, right. the has, same effect. Yeah. But yeah. but in addition to Prince, Tom Petty, mm. Tom Petty's drug overdose was fentanyl. Yeah, yeah, and and it's 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 a, there's certainly an epidemic. I, I've been trying to figure out what is the is the high that great. I mean, I have no sense or idea, obviously. Um, but I I'm just out of curiosity. How wonderful is this high? Because, um, you know, I've seen people who've taken meth and, and people who've taken cocaine, and obviously the high is different for all of them. Like it's but, an addicting something. Yeah, that, but what, mm -hmm. is, what is the high like for, does anyone know what the so, high is like for fentanyl? So, Neo, people generally don't take fentanyl on its own. Fentanyl is something that finds itself or that has now found itself into the world drug supply. It's in heroin. It's in morphine. It's in codeine. It's in cocaine. Anything that's a white powder. Fentanyl is making its way into the supply, and what it does is... Oh, so it's is, like cut with that. Yeah, and or it's much more potent. It. So, mm -hmm. so people who, you know, if someone has a regular Coke habit and says, okay, well, this is how much a bump usually is for me. Well, if a quarter of it is fentanyl now, and you're used to this, and now it's going to take you to this level, or, you know, fry your brain, 
then that's wow. the associated risk. In Canada, we have uh, fentanyl kits that are available where people can test their drugs to see if there's any mm. fentanyl in them. Um, and so we weird. also have access to uh, naloxone kits. Um, if you just Google naloxone kits Canada, you can find um, pharmacies or health centers in your area that have these naloxone kits available. And that's basically what the Narcan uh, kit was. There's um, one that's injected, one that's uh, inhaled through the nostrils. So in Canada, the fentanyl issue is so big that we have these kits readily available for people. And a very important thing that goes along with that as part of the PSA, if someone overdoses in Canada, call 911, administer the naloxone if you have it, and know that the Good Samaritan Act, the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act protects you from simple drug possession charges. So providing that you're not a distributor, Call 911 and know that you are being protected by the Good Samaritan Act because you're acting in the interest of preserving a human life. Can I just And uh, that's what I have you. to say. Thank I you. I just want to say before we get to the rest of the comments, I just want to get to <laughs> that's what we I have am. our resident doctor on, Dr. Dr. J. Robin Johnson. Um, hey Robin. So she was saying that a tiny amount absorbed in the skin can kill someone. She mm -hmm. also says uh, she reminded us that propofol, propofol killed. MJ as well. Uh, and she also says, because of the opioid crisis, it is hard to have a good pain control for surgeries because the drugs are so controlled and hard to get. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I would also want to add, because Rob B gave a list of, you know, drugs that, you know, include fentanyl mm -hmm. um, or that, being, that are being laced with fentanyl. Ecstasy pills are also at the top of that list. Um, yeah. And a lot of young people don't know that, you know, they take ecstasy to get like, you know, this euphoric high, but they don't know what's in that pill. Um, it looks cute. A lot of ecstasy pills have happy faces on them or, you know, clown faces or whatever, but they don't know the origins of that pill. And so okay. a lot of young people are being affected by it fentanyl overdoses, a lot of young people. And so again, you know, my point in, in bringing this topic and showing this video, it really made me sad in the moment this week. It really made me sad yeah. Um, yeah. for this officer yeah. who, as his partner was saying, even as he was ODing, he was apologizing. Yeah, that was, that was sorry. weird to me. He was sorry. apologizing for, in his mind, being careless. And it's like, no, you know, you were you were attempting to do the right thing and get this off the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and hopefully this will be like a good lesson for other people. Like, you know, be careful yeah. out there. Yeah. Be careful out there, yeah. folks. Johnny, your thoughts? Um, just to follow what Liz was saying, that's the thing, um, him apologizing saying that he was sorry, he probably didn't even believe that it was that simple for him to mm -hmm. get affected mm -hmm. by something like that. And I know in the article it read that there were a lot of secondary exposures to even like toddlers and babies and stuff like that. That's so scary. I personally know somebody that actually died of purchasing, um, I don't know what kind of pill, it could have been a Xanax, I don't know. It, it, but it was a drug and it was laced with fentanyl and they passed away. So oh. yeah. It's real. It's seriously real. I I wouldn't compare it. I heard, I've heard people compare it to crack, the crack epidemic, but I would never compare it to that. But um, why? Yeah. Why would you not? Because I think I think it was crack was something that was like cheaper, and then also it wasn't like we didn't have people like us that were vouching for um, the opposite. Like we people didn't care. It was common, or it was accepted also, I rather. Think also, I think with crack, you kind of knew what you were getting with crack. That's true. Like crack is crack. I'll give you that. This is something that's being added to the drug that you're think you think you're getting. Right. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. True. So it's laced. Um, true. Exactly, and that and that's the scary part. Like a lot of people Me. don't know. Uh, most people aren't willingly going out and seeking and buying fitness. it. Do we know if it's you know, fentanyl right. is more? I mean, is it is it more addictive or equally addictive to other drugs? I I would say more potent. I don't know about the addiction. So it just brings mm -hmm. the high high. But the, the potency yeah. is just ridiculous. Hmm. Um, ridiculous. Well, I'm, so I'm Robin Johnson chimes in on that one. 
um, I, I just want people to be safe. Like I'm not advocating for drugs. Um, but if you choose to indulge, just be safe with what you're using and putting into your body or what you're coming into contact with. It's the same. Like if you think about yeah. a meth lab, right? A lot of times when a, a, a police mm-hmm. department, they go into a meth lab, they have Careful. full gear on because they yeah. cannot ingest those fumes. Those fumes get into their pores. It get it gets into their lungs. Like it's very potent, potent. And it's the same with fentanyl. Um, so be careful, yeah. people. Just please be careful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. So Dr. J, Dr. J did chime in to say that uh, fentanyl is 20 times more potent than morphine. Wow. Gee. That, uh, wow. That's why that shit kills. And morphine wow. is exceptionally potent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had morphine. Oh, my gosh. I, I've had morphine. When I had surgery, I had morphine, so I could not even imagine. I told, you guys I, I told you guys I had that pulmonary embolism. They gave me morphine. I was in so much pain, they gave me morphine, and I was so out of it. I wow. Was just, I was just like, it was total <laughs> La La Land. I was in La La Land for <laughs> I won't even take Percocet because- yeah, I don't take Percocet pregnancy. either. I won't do it either. Because um, mm-hmm. when I had my surgery, they, I had mo- morphine in the hospital, but they regulate that. Mm-hmm. But then when, they, when you leave the hospital, they, you know, subscribe, they prescribe you um, opioids. Tylenol, Tylenol and or Percocet. Mm-hmm. And the first time I took the Percocet, I was just like, okay, all it's doing is knocking me out. Yep. I was out for like six hours. Mm-hmm. That's not what I wanted. So I threw that shit in the trash. I'm with you. Um, yeah. So it's 20 times Pain more relief. potent. That's crazy. Uh, that is crazy to me. Crazy. That is crazy. I can imagine. Let's get to these comments online. Uh, so Dr. J says also, she says the crack epidemic was stigmatized to black and brown and treatment was to arrest. Opioid has a different face, <laughs> and now they want treatment. That's, well, that's so true, that. too. Then there's <laughs> that. Then that there's so that. True. Then there's that. I mean, I, I, was, I am always surprised at how much we're, we're finally talking about, as it always should have been, uh, you know, that this was more of a uh, medical issue than a... Um, a, a Street. A, yeah, or a, you know, something that you would arrest for. And and now all of a sudden because it it does have a different face as she says it's, mm-hmm. it's just yeah yeah anyway, that's a good um, point. potency uh, so Mike Runner says potency makes you want to chase the dragon especially if there's if the crash is harder the therefore <laughs> possibly more addictive um, oh my god Jose says uh, let's see she says fentanyl so many losses because of that shit yeah. Um, yeah. So great awareness, Lizzie Anders from Jose. Great topic. So, yeah, what are we calling this? Are we calling this truth, lies, Bird. or shenanigans? Oh, everybody's going some truth. All right, let's get to the next one. Truth, lies, shenanigans. I like that. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Rob B, you're up next. You wanted to talk about Trump and the soccer team. What's going on? Absolutely. Well, seeing as the Central Park Karen is now my compatriot, I guess your compatriot, (laughs) Trump, so your compatriot, Trump, had some words to share about the bronze medal Olympic women's soccer team. Um, So in comments, he said, Woke means you lose. Everything that is woke goes bad, and our our soccer team certainly has. If our soccer team, headed by a radical group of leftist maniacs, wasn't woke, they would have won the gold medal instead of bronze. The woman with the purple hair played terribly and spends too much time thinking about radical left politics and not doing her job. The one with the purple. So now they were knocked out of contention for met for the gold medal after losing to Canada one nothing earlier this week. Um, oh, you had to put that in there? You had to put that in there, Robbie? You had to put that in there, Robbie? They lost to gold medal winners. There's no shame in that. No shame in that. Um, nice. I, nice. Yeah, congratulations, Canada. Congratulations. Yeah, congrats, congrats, Canada. Canada. Right. So the 
The woman with the purple hair that he was singling out is Megan Rapino, and there is no love loss between Rapino and Trump. They've got beef that goes back <laughs> uh, in yeah, 2019 when the U.S. when the women's team, the U.S. women's team, uh, eventually won the World Cup. Uh, reporters asked her, like, you know, so are you excited about going to the White House? To which her Liz, do you remember her response? <laughs> I mean, her, uh, her physical she said, response? I'm not going. <laughs> no, her. Oh, I thought she meant when she was like. <laughs> <laughs> but in 2019, if they, when they asked like, her if she was excited about going to the White House, she said, I'm not going to the fucking White House. <laughs> yeah. 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 And at at which point like Trump said, you know, maybe she should win before she talks. And they did win that one. They beat mm -hmm. the Netherlands 2 0. They won mm -hmm. the World Cup. So, mm -hmm. meh. yeah. So I'm just, I'm really looking for thoughts and impressions on IQ 45, taking a go at Megan Rapino, who is one of your most decorated soccer players, actually ranked number two in the world. And, you know, if you could just roll a quick highlight from the Olympic Games. That, my friends, is a goal from a wow. corner kick. And that's a nigh impossible shot. And she scored two of those during this Olympic. She <laughs> is a leader. She is a champion. She. So Trump's got to go after her. I love this. Johnny, <laughs> talk to me, girl. Talk to me. Let's go with you. I think that it, this is typical Trump to go after like anybody, even athletes or celebrities that have any type of political opinion. Like any politically uh, motivated athletes or celebrities, Trump is has an opinion on, especially if it's against his. Except for Kanye, he loves Kanye. But um, <laughs> no, I think that like Colin Kaepernick, he went after him, and they don't like that the women's national. Uh, or I'm saying it wrong. The women's soccer team. They don't like that they're using their platform for uh, social justice or, like he said, leftist. Uh, opinions and agendas and stuff like that. So, I don't care for IQ forty five. He's gone. I haven't heard. I haven't heard him in the in the news until now. Rob, you brought him back. I was gonna say <laughs> you know, that. That is my. You're welcome. You know what? That's the, <laughs> you know, that is what I wanted to talk about because I was Typical like, Canadian. I am so tired of giving Trump any kind of like uh, any. I hate that man. I, I'm so tired. No, I I'm so glad that he's like was had somewhat disappeared <laughs> but yeah uh, you know he's, he's just trying to stay relevant at this point i mean that, that's really all he's trying to do is trying to stay relevant which there is no relevance yeah. to trump at this point i mean he's mm -hmm. he's had his time but, he's done I, i'm tired of talking but that's, the thing. but that's the thing how are you going to call women the u.s women's national team out for being say nothing losers. about the men's your ass just lost in november Oh yeah, who's the loser? Where are you right? saying? Where are you living right now? It's not at the White House in Washington D.C. Uh, yeah, you are a loser, a sore loser to the point where you incited a riot in the nation's capital. Shame on you! How are you considering or calling yourself a true American and a patriot when you are yeah. calling for Americans to lose? It, and Mike Winter, because Mike Winter, you know, is one of my besties, and we watch a lot of sports together. I have a lot of American athletes that I don't like. However, when they are participating and competing in international competition, I root for my fucking country. So don't Represent. tell me you are a patriot when you are rooting and champion, championing the loss yeah. of an American team. Like, what kind of former president are you? Yeah. And you're pissed off. <laughs> the only reason why you're doing that is because you're pissed off because she called you out? Like, again, One thank member you. of the team. One member no, of the team. No, thank you. Or multiple members. No, of the team. thank you, Rob, for bringing Holy this motherfucker powder. back to the forefront because we've had some <laughs> easy days since November not having to deal with him every day. But this just goes to show you that he is not a true American patriot. Mm. Not at all. Especially for a women's team, these aren't criminals. These aren't rapists. These aren't druggies. These aren't people that, you know, have come out against our country. They've come out against Trump. 
That's a difference. Yeah. That's a difference. Politics. And so, you know, I, I, I did feel bad, obviously, you know, that they um, lost in, they lost and had to go to the bronze medal game. They won the bronze. Yeah. However, they, for whatever reason, they didn't play well the entire <laughs> tournament. Trump wouldn't know about that because he's never been an athlete, never been in any type of athletic <laughs> competition in his life. So he doesn't understand yeah. the, the, the no. idea of any given Sunday. You win he played some, collegiate you basketball some. during the Vietnam War. He played collegiate basketball during the Vietnam War. No, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait, like, really? Are you he making really this up? Is, what are you is, talking is, about? Is, is that why you didn't go to know. war? That's why, that he, didn't why he didn't go to war? Are you making this war? up? He played collegiate. Like, are you talking about for I can't the actual see his team? little hands gripping a basketball? His little hands. He played collegiate basketball <laughs> at the Wharton School of Business. Ooh, ooh. The, the, <laughs> those, 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 yeah, he played basketball in college. Yeah. <laughs> at the Wharton oh, well, School of Business. Look, intramural. Those top athletes. Those, no, not even intermittent club sport. Maybe club a club sport. sport. Maybe intermittent intramural. <laughs> I, I just I, I can in. never see myself coming out and and speaking out against you know my national team like this. Like that just shows you that he is a hater. He is not about America. He is not about patriotism or naturalism. He is about Trumpism, people. You know, and I it's appreciate it. Last night, so last night the women's basketball team won their seventh straight gold medal. And for those of you who don't know, Megan Rapino is engaged to women's basketball player Sue Bird. Sue and Bird. so I appreciate cool. I appreciate it. They showed them embracing. You know, Megan Rapino was congratulating her. Nice hug, nice kiss. That's what we are about. We support so our own. So the women's basketball team is just as woke as the soccer team, but they took gold. That there's exactly. I'm not understanding. I'm not exactly. understanding. Yeah. As is the men's See? team. The men's took gold. Yeah. I'm See? just saying. That's why I already know I'm what we're gonna saying. label this one. For <laughs> oh, I'm tired of it. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, we're not yet. I we're not going. We're not even there yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go, Gingy. Go, Gingy. He is horrible. <laughs> we are so happy that he is out of our everyday conversation. Yeah. Um, I know mm -hmm. you're in Canada, but you have no idea. Like it's just. Woo, yes, I, I can do. wake up in the morning. I can wait. <laughs> I can wake up in the morning and just argue with Remy, my cat. And not yeah. argue with the president of the United States every single day of my life. All right, it's amazing. Our... It's an amazing feeling. It's let's amazing. Get to our comments online. So. Loser, loser, loser. <laughs> I know he's such a hater. <laughs> he is. Like what? Who asked right. you? So uh, Mike Winter says that's why he's good at shooting paper towels at Puerto Rican. <laughs> <laughs> oh my oh, god! Started. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> He that also, comment wins. That is that's probably the best comment. Yet. That was very funny. <laughs> All right. Like, he also says the number of Trumpists who have been on Facebook cheering against the American Olympians was unprecedented. It's shameful. It's shameful. It's shameful. It's shameful. It's shameful. It's I, shameful. Listen, y'all, I rooted for Jennifer Capriati, who I can't stand, but she is American. <laughs> I have to root for yeah. her. It's American. I have to root for her. Yep. Uh, Jose yeah. also says on, on YouTube, Trump is the biggest sore loser that ever walked the earth. Always has been a loser, always will be a loser. That's why he tries so hard. And then Jacqueline Robinson says, uh, meanwhile, his, his, his tub of lard ass could barely roll over to get out of bed <laughs> and stand in line at the almond station in his, his shitty resort. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Paulette says he still plays golf in his free time. <laughs> Paulette Bertrand. Oh. <laughs> but you're right. I, oh this is uh, what are we going with? What are we going with? I, I think we got it. I think we all know. We already, you already put it up there. Shenanigans. Shenanigans. The devil is full of lies. Shenanigans. The devil is full of lies. <laughs> all right. And shenanigans. <laughs> the U.S. women's shenanigans. The U.S. women's soccer team did not lose. They came in third in the world, and they in always the finish in the top. 
they always finish in the top four. It's such a strong squad and has been for decades. So yeah. don't shit on champions. Yeah. Yes. All right. All yeah, right. Part. On to our next topic. Our next topic goes to Gianni Storm. Gianni, you got more going on with climate change. What are we talking about, Gianni? What are we talking about, Gianni? What's happening now with climate change? Okay. So CNN posted an article. I'm going to read a little bit of it. Scientists say a crucial system of currents in the Atlantic Ocean that helps control temperatures and helps the entire planet's weather system is showing signs of instability due to human-made climate change. This is similar to the 2004 climate science fiction film, The Day After Tomorrow, if you guys have seen it, where a series mm -hmm. of extreme weather strikes, weather disaster strikes after climate change causes the AMOC to collapse. So my question to the panel is, what can we do as regular civilians to prepare for the doom, potentially, of what's to come? Or is there anything that we can do for Real quick, tell our audience what AMOC is. Um, I will look the that Atlantic, up. <laughs> the, Atlantic <laughs> the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. <laughs> right. Yes. So wait, the day after tomorrow, is, is that? That was a good movie. With Dennis, I enjoyed that movie. Dennis Quaid that and Dennis Jake Quaid. Gyllenhaal? Yeah. That, Dennis, yeah. I agree with you, Neo. Good movie. I Love it. It was Love a good it. movie. I could watch that. Yeah. All Gary. day, every day. Great movie. I don't always like apoc Gary. apocalyptic movies, but I enjoyed that one. Yeah, Liz, because imagine being in that situation. Like, would I would die seriously? It, it's like the entire. It's like you said, apocalyptic, like huge, massive weather changes. I, I think that um, basically scientists are warning that it could get to that point, or as it's just a lot more flooding. Like they're they're and they're expecting a lot more flooding in the coming years a lot more water rain so it's going to be very wet um what do you guys what do you guys think let's start with lizzie i think it makes me sad and again it goes back to at least my own personal observance of you know climate change and so climate change for you know those people who don't know isn't just okay one day the climate is different mm -hmm. it's 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 the the it's tracking um, a sequence of different climates, and so I I often tell people you know I used to live in Finland when I lived in Finland in the early nineties like if they had temperatures in the low eighties that was considered a heat wave. The last oh, time wow. I was in Finland in twenty eighteen, temperatures were in the nineties. There used to be no ACs, no air conditioning units in Finland. Yeah. Both of my, my, the, my Finnish sister, she had on the top floor, they had an AC. My Finnish parents had an AC. I'm like, okay, so there is a shift. It's about the, sh the consistent yeah. shift. The climate, the climate is changing, not for one yes. day, but consistently. Like I was sweating in Finland, who knew? Who knew? We are <laughs> they, they are close. They are close to the North Pole. <laughs> Who knew I would be sweating in Finland? And so it scares me. It, it, that is scary. it scares me. And people aren't paying attention because it not only affects the temperature, it affects the environment. It affects anim it affects it affects the environment. It affects animals. It affects how we respond to things. It affects Food. the weather. Like food, yeah. like I, the fact that people don't want to pay attention to this and, you know, call me, you know, being partisan if you want, but a lot of this is driven by American Republicans or conservatives who don't want to vaccinate, by the way, but <laughs> it, it, it's scary. It's scary this because there's man. so much, there's so much proof out there that this is happening. And no, they yeah. don't want to pay attention. And so, Gianni, it's going to be like the movie Day After Tomorrow, where we find out at the 11th hour when it's too late. Um, and yeah. I, I don't know, because a lot of times when I think about apocalypse situations... Is it already situations, too late? I don't oh my know, gosh, you know, like yeah. I think about apocalypse situations so. and where I would go. Like, where am I going to go? I mean, I guess I could go to Finland, but I only have a couple of years. 
even if I go there. I mean, the carbon you know? dioxide's in the air, and so we're just going to continue to get hotter. It's not like it's going to dissipate or something. I mean, sure. Atlantis. It takes Atlantis. That's where I'm going to go. The underworld. For the, for, for the carbon the dioxide. The underworld. Atlantis. 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 I'm going to go with Jeff Bezos Atlantis. in in that little rocket. <laughs> I mean, when we're looking at temperatures. Let me say they said the hottest temp <laughs> in British Columbia. British Columbia mm -hmm. it set a record for the hottest temperature at a hundred. This is Canada, guys. Canada, a hundred and fourteen point ninety eight degrees Fahrenheit. Dozens of people died. Dozens, dozens of people died what? during that heat wave, Neil. In Canada. What? Yes. I remember. I think it was because I was still in New York City. What? So I'm gonna say this was like 2016 or 17. I remember in New York City in January, blizzard, you know, lots of snow, whatever. In, in New York City yeah. in January, in Helsinki, Finland, again, close to the North Pole. When I lived in Finland, I mean, in January, there was at least, you know, two, three feet of snow on the ground. That particular year, there was no snow in Finland. There was more snow in New York City than there was in Finland. And my host mom was yeah. sending me pictures like, we haven't had snow for like a month. And I'm thinking, okay, so the end of days is coming because my God, <laughs> yeah. what? What? Yes. And, and that, I'm sorry. It's, it's... I'm, I'm sorry. They set the record was 100, first set at 114. But then two days later, they set a record at uh, 121 degrees. In oh, that's British that's Columbia, I don't Canada. Think my, I don't think my AC can deal with 121, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> I mean, we're not even talking like the desert somewhere. We're talking Canada. I don't... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And BC is and a this coastal is heat that province. You can feel. And it's cold up there. Yeah. I mean, it gets cold up there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I've been to BC. I, like I like heard it gets cold. Y'all know I don't like the heat. <laughs> I want it to be as cold as possible. I'm so I, I if the entire cold. planet is warming, like what, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Y'all see like my hair looks a mess. Humidity, humidity. <laughs> You're crazy. All right. So I know Rob B's got all the so science do, behind it. Rob B, go ahead. Yeah. Do you guys have any solution? Um, so as I was reading through that article, Johnny, uh, one of the um, scientist bears that was interviewed uh, when he was asked what we need to do, uh, the world needs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as much and as quickly as possible. So the only thing that we can do as regular civilians, as regular citizens, is to change our consumption habits. Don't drive unless you have to. Stop wasting. I have no use license. Reusable. I'm not driving. I have you, no license. But use, reuse, use reusable need a resources million of whenever people. possible. Avoid plastics. And what's really What's a game changer? Research your foods. Find out what the resource cost of your favorite foods and drinks are. Just for fun, I decided to go with an average cola. A cola is made out of water that's pumped out of local waterways and shipped to other markets, never to return, reducing potable water supplies, and you're running a factory. There's an energy cost with that, and there's greenhouse gas emissions. High fructose yeah. corn syrup comes from corn. It's harvested, it's sent to a mill to be crushed, separated, chemically processed so that they can get to the right concentration. Again, huge energy cost. Caramel color is harvested from corn, wheat, sugar beets, sugar cane. Yet they're boiled down and processed. So huge manufacturing cost. Phosphoric acid is a chemical manufacturing process. Natural flavors, eh, I don't even know what the hell that is. It's an ingredient. <laughs> and then synthetic caffeine, right? Natural flavors. Okay, yeah, well, all the time. Yeah. I always wonder about Caf that. <laughs> and synthetic yeah, caffeine. Is, that is. <laughs> and synthetic caffeine is produced from urea and chloro what? chloroacetic acid. So, synthetic, I mean, just caffeine? this is just from. Oh yeah, it's not natural caffeine that you get in your cola. Yeah, it's disgusting. No, that, that, that's all, that's all. So. Just a simple cola has a huge manufacturing slash resource cost. Well, at what point do we say, well, we don't need the diabetes or this vanilla tasting syrup garbage just because yeah, people I'm like it. Sure. If it's killing the planet, then there's no point in having it. Real quick. Diabetes, I'm not sharing my insulin with anybody. I'm not sharing. 
I'm not sharing. <laughs> All right. So don't yeah. catch it. So don't do it. Really quickly go through these comments Thanks. online because uh, this was actually a busy one. Um, so Robin John says, people keep ignoring it, but if they don't make serious changes, the earth will end as we know it. Um, and abruptly. It's going to happen quick, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Rude awakening. <laughs> Rude awakening. Jeanette Brown says, yep. it's national security, Seriously. migration and immigration, public health, society, culture. Yep. Brent Everything. Atkinson. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Brent Atkinson says, thanks to all the West Coast wildfires yesterday, Denver had the worst air quality See? in the world. The yeah. Dixie Fire. The Dixie Fire. My friend in Colorado was complaining about the air the entire quality town as just, a result just of the down. Dixie Fire. Uh, well, so says, greenhouse gas emissions are the main cause of the main climate cause. changing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Paulette Bertrand says, yes, beautifying yards by getting rid of dandelion with products that also destroy bees and insects, uh, destroy bees and all other insects. Daria Winter says, uh, but it's not just heat, but floods and tornadoes, animals, mm -hmm. yes. without mm -hmm. food sources. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline yeah. Robinson says, does anyone also remember when we were younger? Our parents watered their lawns typically around 6 p.m. because the temperatures were cooler. Now we're seeing temperatures of 80 degrees or more yeah. at 11 p.m. in the evening. Late, yes. Every single noticed. night. Y'all think I'm Every joking night. when I say I keep my AC on 12 months out of All the day. year. It is hot in All here. Day. And it I want to get this, hot last, in here. this last comment in. Uh, <laughs> my father is. Ephraim says, Rupka, Olivia E., Jumped from Olympic size swimming pool top ladder, and I was scared and closed my eyes praying. Aww. <laughs> Aww. 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 That's the cutest. That was, that was he was responding. To we gotta have we gotta I have oh earlier. come on and tell her uh, tell us about her Sorry. swimming Sorry. her <laughs> swimming experiences. Yes, and actually I think it was a Wilson <laughs> pool he's talking about. <laughs> so that's so cute. That was a high. That, I say that was a high diving board at Wilson though. I think I yeah. jumped off it twice. <laughs> I was like, that's enough. You no, know, I jumped off it. It just, I had to get my touch up before All right, I did all. Out of time. So, <laughs> <laughs> what are we calling this? Is this truth, lies, or shenanigans? Scary truth. It's true. Okay. Scary truth. Oh, you guys have truth the whole truth. Things. I'm going to do better the next time. I'm going to do better. So, all right, that's it. Do better. <laughs> do better boards the next time. All right. Uh, so let's just jump right on into our game show. Great job, guys. Great topics. All right. Today we have Olympic trivia. I'll just go around the horn one by one, ask you an Olympic question. Get the right Can answer. Can we bring Maritza back? Can we bring Maritza back? <laughs> she to help has us? logged. Unfortunately, she has signed off. Logged out. Not this time. <laughs> she could be on my team. <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, right. All right. So what we're going to do is actually I'm going to ask the first question and see who gets it right because we're going to ask a question about Maritza. Oh, well, damn it! I shouldn't have said that. I'm a <laughs> okay. What year did Maritza win the? Uh, that ain't what that says. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna say. <laughs> what year did about... Maritza win the most valuable student athlete for the University of Georgia? Anybody? 1997. No. <laughs> 96. Nope. Too far this back. isn't 99? that. So this is that's a test question because that's not exactly. Yes, it's choice. a test. It's a test question. Two thousand three. Um, is it a trick? Oh. Two thousand three. Oh, she was wow. the most valuable student athlete at the University of Georgia. Yep. And she was also in twenty fourteen USA Swimming <laughs> Diversity Inclusion Award. She won that as well. So, still a couple. Right. Of She's won every right. award that exists. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the first question, Lizzie. I'm going to give it to you. You get lucky this time. What year was the first modern Olympic Games held? 1896. 1888, 1896, 1922, or 1936? 1896. 1896. That is correct. The first modern Olympic Games were held in 1896 in Athens, Greece. The games were very different back then. All right. They were. Yeah. What do the five Olympic rings represent? This is for Rod B. The 
five parts of the world that compete in the Olympic Games, the five pillars of Olympic values, charity, sportsmanship, compassion, five original <laughs> sports that made up the original Olympic competitions, the five <laughs> elements of the <laughs> earth, earth, wind, and fire, and sun. The five parts of the world that it competed in the Olympic Games. That's the first one. A. Check it. That is correct. 1913. <laughs> Pierre Coubert designed the Olympic rings to represent the five parts of the world that compete in the Olympic Games. Contrary to popular belief, the colors do not represent a specific continent, but rather the colors in all national flags at the time of its creation. Hmm, interesting. Awesome. All right. This is for Gianni. What are the four new sports being added to the 2020 Tokyo Olympics? Is it surfing, climbing, race walking, and skateboarding? Is it climbing, skateboarding, tug of war, and karate, wrestling, race walking, lyrical dancing, and surfing, or karate, <laughs> sport climbing, surfing, and skateboarding? Hmm. I think the third one. I could. Be, ooh. Okay, I lied. It's not the third one. I think <laughs> it is. Maybe shaking her head, giving her clues. The fourth one. It's been a part of the Olympics for a while. You said the four. Okay. Yeah, so karate, sport, climbing, surfing, and skateboarding. I believe it's number two. Oh no, she got it no. correct. Correct. Judo's always Yay. been there. Karate's a new one. <laughs> Good job. Wow. Good job. So, correct. The four sports added to the 2020 Tokyo Olympics are surfing, sport climbing, skateboarding, and karate, baseball, and softball are also being reinstated. Mm -hmm. It's going to be Olympic Games like no other, it says. All right. Nice. <laughs> In which summer sport has Canada won the most Olympic medals? This is for Lizzie, not. Why aren't you giving this to Rob B? No, we're going I'm to Lizzie. Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is it canoe, slalom, cycling, swimming, or athletics? Rob B, you going to help a sister out? <laughs> um, okay, I'll help you out by saying I have no idea what the fuck canoe slalom is. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds fun. <laughs> It does. <laughs> All right, that was hard. Round. We'll see. Got to get it right. In which summer sport? Okay. Oh. Canada. Okay, take a guess. Take a guess. Run out of time. I'm going to say athletics. Athletics, which is track and field. That is correct. Athletics. <gasps> Yay, Canada's good guess. the most summer Olympic medals in athletics, track and field, and won a total of 60 medals. All right, nice, Robbie, to stay in it. During the 2020 Olympic Games, how many towels did the Olympic Village go through? <laughs> 75,000, 100,000, 125,000, or 165,000? Wow. How does one even begin to try to quantify that <laughs> in one's mind? How do you quantify mind? that? How do you I know. How many people were in the village, and how many times a day were they bathing on average? That's. <laughs> I know. Let's go. Well, how many 125. Times, how many times? You going 125? Okay. Let's see. That is incorrect. Incorrect. So Rob B does not win a third in a row. 000. The Olympic Village required 165,000 towels for just over two weeks of activity during the 2012 London Olympics. That's All right, Gianni. Terrible. This is for for to stay in it. What animal, animal was the first Olympic mascot? Was it a duck, a bear, a dachshund, <laughs> or a platypus? A dachshund. <laughs> I'm going to say a bear because it just, I don't know why a platypus would be. That is incorrect. It was the dachshund. <laughs> the first official Olympic mascot a was Wallaby. Dog. The dachshund. The sausage dog. In the 1972. Munich Olympic Games. That means Lizzie is Terrible. the winner of the game. I mean, if I'm not winning the sports categories, Lord. <laughs> if I'm not winning the sports categories, then my God, what's All happening? All right. Good job, guys. Let's the get started. Dachshund, though. <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> guess the Dachshund either. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> All right, Gianni. Shout outs. Um, shout out to Maritza and shout out to Puerto Rico and Black Excellence. Puerto Rico. Black Excellence. I love it. Robbie Rock. Uh, shout out to all of the Olympians that were out there putting it all on the line uh, with the closing games. That's uh, 
to some it's the beginning of a career to many it's uh the end of a career so kudos to all of the olympians who actually made it there you're the top in the world you didn't lose you made it to the show exactly, exactly. apparently jose knew it was the wiener dog by the way uh, <laughs> hot dog Duh. hot dog that's what we call it the hot, hot dog. dog all right lizzie dog. Um, <laughs> shout out to my intern. So this coming week is their last week for the summer portion of their internship. Um, very proud of them. They're doing a lot of good work this summer. Still a lot of a, a ways to go in terms of their learning and their growth as it relates to journalism. Um, but I'm mm-hmm. proud of them. I'm proud of them. And I'm proud of, to be a part of this program. Um, not just because it's ESPN, but because it is teaching students about the proper protocols of writing, interviewing, and journalism. So shout out to my kids. All shout right. out to my cheering. Nice. Love y'all. Love, Love, Love y'all. The future. All right. The future. The future. And my shout out goes out to Olivia E, whose birthday is tomorrow. Happy birthday, girl. Happy birthday. She's on vacation oh, right now. You. Hope you're having fun. And our final shout out goes to the winner of our pet shenanigans of the week. Mm-hmm. Anne Malo <laughs> posted her two beautiful <laughs> black and white kitties bunched Thank together you. inside a cat playhouse with the caption, they fit just fine. Uh, see all of the beautiful pets or to post your favorite pets photo, make sure you join the TLS Pet Shenanigans Facebook group. The photo with the most likes and comments gets a shout out every week. And that is officially all the time we have for today's show. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We hope that you may you maybe learn something, gain a new perspective, even got some things off your chest. Please don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe, and share at TLS Live Show. Make sure you check out YouTube, TLSShow.com, for our clips tomorrow. Now, our next TLS Live show is next Sunday, August 15th, where we'll have another COVID Chronicles episode. And to let you know, that will be our very last show of our second season. We'll be taking a short break as we prepare to bring you a fresh new third season of Truth Live Shenanigans on September 12th. But for our live audience, still keep watching. Sunday's 4 p.m. We're going to have some special shows for you. And don't forget this Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Gianni Storm and Olivia E. will be going unscripted. Actually, it'll be me and Gianni going unscripted (laughs) on Wednesday. And the winner for our final (laughs) thought of the day. Why say Lord? Lord. (laughs) Is Lizzie. Good luck to you, Gianni. Good luck to you, Gianni, girl. Is Lizzie. Lizzie Enders. Lizzie, close it out. Fun topic. So once again, I just want to give um, a parting shot um, out to all of my ladies in the struggle. I have a lot of um, female friends right now who are dissolving relationships, whether it be in the worst way because of um, physical abuse or just because, you know, people grew apart. It's difficult. And I think our ladies need a lot of support. Our ladies need less judgment, and they all need a hug. So to my ladies out there who are transitioning from being a wife to being whatever else, we love you. We got your back. And if you need to talk, hit me up. Hit me up. I know it's difficult, but we with you. We with you. All right. Thank you so much for that thought. That's beautiful, Liz. Yep. I also want to thank uh, Olympia Maritza McClendon for joining us. Fantastic interview. We enjoyed having you. Thank you, Gianni, Rob, Lizzie, and our people behind the scenes, Jose and Olivia E. But most importantly, we want to thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you next time. Oh, yeah.